agency that primarily deals with flying drones for operations overseas and tracking down and killing suspected members of al-Qaeda and related organizations. Drones are unmanned aerial vehicles, known as UAVs, are aircrafts that can fly without an onboard human operator. Drones can fly either by remote control or on a predetermined flight path, can be as small as an insect and as large as a traditional jet. Now drones are being considered for use in domestic surveillance operations, which might include in furtherance of homeland security, crime fighting, disaster relief, immigration control, and environmental monitoring. In fact, the FAA has predicted that 30,000 unmanned aircraft could be flying in U.S. skies in less than 20 years. One reason for this expansion has been a push by Congress for faster integration of UAVs into U.S. airspace. Recently, as part of the FAA Modernization and Reform Act of 2012, Congress mandated that the Federal Aviation Agency, the FAA, which we've been referring to, quote, develop a comprehensive plan to safely accelerate the integration of civil unmanned aircraft systems into the national airspace system. This plan shall provide for integration of UAVs by September 2015. Now, supporters of the bill say, quote, the legislation brings an end to outrageous ticket subsidies for air service to some small airports under the Essential Air Service Program. The new law eliminates federal subsidies as high as $3,720 per ticket, prohibits new communities from joining the program, and reduces costs for the taxpayers. Pedro Kitchens is a visiting scholar at the City University of New York. He says some observers caution that the FAA is not prepared to handle privacy issues. Although relatively few drones are currently flown over U.S. soil, the FAA predicts that around 30,000 drones will fill the nation's skies in less than 20 years. Um, Congress has played a large role in the expansion because in uh, February 2012, Congress enacted the FAA Modernization and Reform Act which calls for the FAA to accelerate the integration of unmanned aircraft into the national airspace system by 2015. However, since some members of Congress and the public fear that there are insufficient safeguards in place to ensure that drones are not used to spy on American citizens uh, and unduly infringe upon their uh, fundamental privacy, uh, these observers caution that the FAA is primarily charged with ensuring air traffic safety and is not adequately prepared to handle the issues of privacy and civil liberties raised by drone use. So the question is whether or not this new technology is even really necessary. According to Caleb Malpin from the International Action Center, the use of drones not only saves the government from having to create more jobs in the aviation industry, but the military can also benefit from the use of unmanned aerial vehicles. Well, there's a trend. It's not just in, in military, but it's actually mainly in, uh, in, in uh, private production of eliminating workers. You know, the goal is to have as much be done with a machine as possible and hire as few people as can be hired. Um, and if you can have a machine replace a person, it leads to more profits. It leads to, to, to less having to deal. You know, a machine doesn't need health care. A machine doesn't really need wages. Uh, so that, that's kind of a trend we're seeing you know, globally. Um, and it's part of the economic problems we're having currently, because if people aren't buying, then you can't sell those products you produce. And so as you eliminate workers in the process of production, people still don't buy the products. And so we're seeing that in the military as well. I think that's a key part of the rise in drone, drone use and military um, exercises uh, and, and military things. However, there is another issue, which is uh, for uh, during the Vietnam War, there was a lot of resistance inside of the US military. Uh, there were, was a group called the American Servicemen's Union, which actively opposed the Vietnam War. And there was a lot of uh, resistance within the military, people shooting their officers and things like that. And there's an understanding that they may not be able to trust soldiers to do some of the things that, that they would like done. And so if they can have machines do it, that, that makes it a lot safer because soldiers can turn their guns around. I mean, it's happened before. Uh, and um, there was a mass resistance, especially by African-American uh, GIs during the Vietnam War. Um, and that was a key reason the US ended up losing the war, was actually resistance within its own ranks. So if they can eliminate rank and file soldiers and have machines do it, that's something they'd very much like to do. And the military right now is a lot smaller than it was prior um, in terms of human beings. Um, it's a lot bigger in terms of weapon systems and things like that, but in terms of actual rank and file soldiers, they're doing their best to try and move away from that, as that could be a potential weakness. I think that it's just an expansion of their international policy, to be quite honest with you. They've engaged in a disgusting genocidal war against the people of the Middle East, and it's another way they can use um, no military personnel involved except computer techies. I don't think 
the drones that they're using uh, in the United States is going to be uh, much different from the drones used overseas in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Yemen. Uh, here they claim they want to do it uh, for surveillance and uh, for our safety. When they say our safety, they really mean uh, an invasion of our privacy. Drones are this dirty secret. The fact that there isn't more outrage about this shows that when push comes to shove, that the liberal and conservative capitalist perspectives aren't that different than each other. Customs and Border Protection, known as CBP, currently has nine unarmed predator drones in its arsenal, each purchased at a cost of $18 million. The drones cost $3,000 per hour to fly, and according to a report by the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General, the agency spent over $55 million to operate and maintain the drones between 2006 and 2011. Despite these costs, CBP never made a specific budget request to Congress for the funds and has thus far failed to seek compensation from the other federal and state agencies it loans its drones to. Instead, the agency diverted $25 million from other programs to cover these costs. Who's going to manufacture these drones? That's the biggest thing. Who's going to manufacture these drones? They're going to cost, these are very expensive, unmanned aircraft, right? Uh, aircraft with no people in them, totally directed. From, that, that's very expensive, and that, that, that's going to be paid. It's going to come out of our, our tax dollars. It's going to be paid to private corporations to develop, private corporations to do research, to develop all these kind of things. This is going to be, I mean, this is a handout. This is a handout to, to the military corporations. A key driving force behind the legislation was the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, whose members include such giants of the military industrial complex as Lockheed Martin, uh, Boeing, General Dynamics, um, Northrop Grumman, and uh, Raytheon, uh, and whose lobbyists reportedly wrote the language of the bill. So the market for the drones already approaches around six billion dollars annually and is expected to double over the next 10 years. When signing the bill, President Obama said this bill gives our nation law enforcement expanded authority to combat illicit drug trafficking on our northern and southern borders. The majority of the problems, even that they claim the drones are specified to address, the majority of those problems are rooted in, in the very social structure. For example, there's all this talk of uh, Mexican drug cartels. You hear that. Oh, you know, there's drugs coming to the United States from Mexico. Well, the people of Mexico on numerous times have tried to elect a government that is, that is opposed to the United States and would serve, serve the people's ends and provide jobs and education. But right now, the people of Mexico live under the, the pre-dictatorship, I, I believe. Prior to that, it was, you know, the Vicente Fox. And, and those, those governments were backed up by the United States, and the elections were stolen. And it's openly acknowledged the State Department was giving funds to the people who are, who are now in office in Mexico to oppose, to oppose a kind of programs that would, that would alleviate the problem of drugs and, and things like that. So this idea that we're going to, if we just have enough drones flying and spying, we're going to stop the, the drug cartels in Mexico, that, that's outrageous and it's, 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 it's totally false. For many, the legislation underscores the link between the growth of U.S. militarism abroad uh, and the steady advance of police state repression at home. Um, opponents are afraid that this uh, proliferation of drones sets the stage for a vast expansion of state spying upon American citizens um, because drones can carry sophisticated surveillance equipment and it's capable of not only photographing and video recording every step taken by individuals once they leave their homes, um, but it's also capable of intercepting electronic communications uh, and, and even cell phone calls. Joshua Storms is a political scientist and writer who recently graduated from the University of New Haven and who has done extensive research on the use of unmanned aerial vehicles. I ask him in regards to national safety whether there are ramifications if the line of communication between the pilot and aircraft fails and could this be dangerous to the public? This is why the FFA does regulate UAVs um, and there have been several instances of lines of communication failing and instances of crashing into people's backyards. Accident rate is actually seven times higher than general aviation, and it's 353 times higher than commercial aviation. Right now, as far as the accident rate of UAVs and drone surveillance technology domestically in the United States. Uh, right now, there are F, um, UAVs that do function as border patrol, and they've even sent them into Mexico to track uh, Mexican drug cartels. And there have been instances of crashing in uh, people's backyards in a town in Mexico and other instances where the line of communication fails, 
and these crash in the mountains. But there's not been any serious incidences, but just the, the very basic threat of this as a possibility is why we don't see widespread um, UAV use just yet. So basically spoofing a GPS system essentially tricks the drone into thinking the directions it's receiving are legitimate and from the operator. So once it's spoofed, a hacker has complete control of the drone. So um, some University of Texas researchers were, actually, researchers were actually able to successfully hack into an overhead drone by spoofing the GPS and they sent it hurtling towards the earth before they set it right again. So uh, the FAA and Department of Homeland Security, DHS, they took notice of this and a month after the experiment, uh, the House Homeland Security Committee held a hearing to investigate further how the drones could potentially become a giant security risk in the states. Um, the panel chairman concluded basically that the findings were very alarming and they revealed a gaping hole in the security of using uh, unmanned aerial systems domestically. So some of the drone makers such as uh, Dragonfly, whose drones are actually already in use by the Seattle police, say that they're not actually worried about the, um, the, the GPS spoofing. They said that their drones fly so low to the ground that if anything goes wrong, they just land the aircraft. So other makers, such as Rotomotion, uh, have prepared for these GPS threats, but um, they were shocked to, to hear about the spoofing tests. Anytime you have an aircraft in the, like, flying and it doesn't have a direct pilot, and there have been instances of failure that you know, if this were to crash into a populated area, it's already gone. One has basically, not defected, but malfunctioned and gone over uh, restricted airspace in Washington, D.C. already. So, I mean, the, the possibility is crashing into a populated area, especially when these range from sizes of, you know, uh, like the small little helicopter that you can buy at a little corner store to the size of a Boeing 747. I mean, like the the safety implications are vast. Currently, the usage of domestic drones has been through the federal, state, and local governments in a range of circumstances. The Department of Homeland Security uses them to police the nation's borders to deter unlawful border crossings by unauthorized aliens, criminals, and terrorists, and to detect and interdict the smuggling of weapons, drugs, and other contraband into the country. According to a recent disclosure by the FAA, several local police departments, state and private colleges, and small cities and towns have also received FAA Certificate of Authorization to fly unmanned aircrafts domestically. The Department of Homeland Security, in conjunction with local law enforcement agencies, has been testing drone capabilities in a host of other situations, including detecting radiation, monitoring a hostage situation, tracking a gun tossed by a fleeing suspect, firefighting, and finding missing persons. Currently, drones can be outfitted with high-powered cameras and thermal imaging devices, uh, license plate readers, laser radar, and even in the near future, law enforcement organizations, they might see, uh, might try and outfit the drones with facial recognition or uh, soft biometric recognition, which can recognize and track individuals based on attributes such as height, um, age, gender, skin color. Um, some of the critics of domestic drone usage do say that with new technology comes privacy invasion and it could bring U.S. Uh, could bring the United States closer to a surveillance society, sort of, uh, in which every citizen's move is monitored, it's tracked, recorded, um, and it can be you know, scrutinized by the government. So uh, the relative sophistication of domestic drones contrasted with uh, traditional surveillance technology may influence a court's decision whether domestic drone use is constitutionally uh, lawful. Everything is happening in the context of a global economic crisis. And as the economy deteriorates, we begin to see more and more domestic unrest. Um, and it's kind of a false narrative. We've all heard this idea that you know, you know, some countries are good because they have freedom and other countries are not so good because they don't have freedom. Because really the amount of civil liberties that exist in any society is almost proportional to the amount of security the regime feels. If the regime feels very unsafe and is under a lot of threat, there's not going to be much civil liberties. But if a regime feels very secure and can do whatever it, whatever it wants uh, and it doesn't feel that it's going to be overthrown, why, well, you can get up and denounce them all day. Uh, so the apparatus of repression is usually linked to how safe the regime feels. Um, and so this, this idea that, you know, we're all often taught the U.S. is great because of its freedom, et cetera. But, I mean, that's, that's not even the case. I mean, you talk about the first few amendments. Uh, 
uh, the freedom of speech, uh, you know, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, the First Amendment itself. At the time that was put in place, that was put in place because uh, of the 13 colonies, I believe nine, had an official state religion. And it was a way that, that, that one state couldn't impose its religion on the other. Um, and, and many of the, the states also had restrictions on freedom of speech. It was merely they didn't want the federal government. When the state feels more threatened, you have some of it. And when they don't feel as threatened, you don't. And right now, in the context of this economic crisis, with so many people being out of work, with so many people being laid off, and turning to radical alternatives. The U.S. government is extremely unpopular, um, um, and there is a rising number of demonstrations. You know, you have ultra-right-wing demonstrations like the Tea Party. You also have left-wing demonstrations like Occupy Wall Street, the, the rising union activity, uh, the mass resistance to NATO. And, it, and as this, this, these, this resistance grows, and as they, as they see that people are suffering and turning to radical alternatives, they're going to feel a need to crack down. And in response to that, we're seeing uh, the use of that. And they also understand that the, the people they're asking to protect their state are the very people who are suffering. And so they're going to try to use machines and other, other mechanisms to use surveillance and, and other means to try and keep it down. It's certainly a violation of privacy and civil rights. Um, and it's not really a surprise. I think you see, you see it's what, what is absolutely undeniable is that Obama has continued uh, W. Bush's uh, erosion of civil rights, and in the name of fighting the war on terror, that he uh, that he believe he's pushing more and more for an erosion of the basic civil liberties that we can do exist. They've made many different measures like this, everything from the regulation of the internet through the regulation of airwaves on the radio, and this is just another step. Um, I think they're trying to uh, give a lip service to uh, placate many people's concerns, but that doesn't change the fact of the matter that uh, they're already tapping us without uh, use of warrants, they're already breaking many laws, and I think this drone would be just as illegal. The Fourth Amendment regulates when, where, and how the government may conduct searches and seizures. So the question is, will domestic drones often violate this amendment considering the fine line between open fields and the immediate area surrounding someone's home that's constitutionally protected? There's no direct uh, court cases involving drone use, but there are involving electronic surveillance. Um, and specifically manned aircraft right now. And there's precedence been set, and there's specifically a case, California v. Uh, Corallo, that sets basically three conditions that um, it does not uh, constitute a search of the home and the immediate property, using the word cur uh, curtilage, uh, that it occurs from a public navigable airspace, uh, is conducted in a physically non-intrusive manner, and also does not reveal intimate activities traditionally connected with the use of a home or curtilage. And right now, a drone use and surveillance doesn't seem to violate any of those precedents. And there's been other cases that have uh, progressed as far as electronic surveillance. There's also, you know, the, the Open Fields Doctrine is set in Hester v. United States in 1924. Uh, there was a, the Fourth Amendment challenge was more rigidly defined as a reasonable expectation of privacy and a society that recognizes that expectation as reasonable. And, it, you know, it, with the dawn of new technology, especially UAVs and electronic surveillance, what that reasonable expectation of privacy with technology that can see through our walls and can basically hover above our homes and our curtilages, the, what that uh, expectation of privacy changes is open to a new legalistic interpretation, but there's been no legal precedent set yet. Well, it, it is. It, it's all, there's a lot of legal arguments we hear. Whenever there's you know, a ruling that, that, that moves in this direction, you know, some will argue the right to privacy, the right to keep the government out of your personal business trumps the right of the state to intervene. And, and there's been a lot of discussion of that. But the amount of violation of civil liberties that has gone on, specifically in the last five years, is so horrifying that it really makes all of that a joke. For example, there's warrantless wiretapping. Right? They can tap your phone without any warrant. And there's, there's weird technicalities, too. For example, um, if, if, a, if a court wants to get your cell phone um, texts, they don't have to go to you. They don't have to serve you a subpoena for that. They just serve the subpoena to the phone company. And the phone company is at no point ever required to tell you that, that your records have been subpoenaed. So there's ways they can go around this um, vastly. And there's also there's, there's all kinds of of legal you know, concerns they have. And at this point, they're more afraid of, of the people rising up against them than they are uh, of any, any possible violations of the civil liberties they've established. So with the use of domestic drones, government will be held more accountable in civil matters, especially in providing evidence between law enforcement agents and private citizen cases.
With the implementation of UAVs in a widespread law enforcement sense, it's going to inevitably bring a clash between, uh, you know, private privacy law and law enforcement that will probably be determined in a court setting, in a legalistic interpretation. It seems like right now the only legal um, actions that are taken against domestic drone use are with the ACLU and FOIA requests. There have been several measures introduced in the 112th Congress that would restrict the domestic use of drones and establish arguably greater constraint on their use than the Fourth Amendment requires. Several bills were prompted by a general concern for potential privacy intrusions by federal and state law enforcement and executive agencies. For instance, preserving freedom from unwarranted surveillance act of 2012 requires any entity acting under the authority of the federal government to obtain a warrant based on probable cause before proceeding with investigative drone surveillance of crime. The general idea of always by many of the critics is that there just needs to be some safeguards put in place with the new technology of surveillance, uh, surveillance drones which could potentially be abused by uh, law enforcement against the average citizen. So uh, a democratic process deciding what regulations will protect the American citizens of their Fourth Amendment rights needs to further develop before numerous amounts of drones are in the skies by 2015. In a report published in December 2011, the ACLU states that when the police have to mount elaborate and costly foot and squad patrols to follow a suspect 24-7, the expenditure of resources serves as a deterrent to abuse. It forces the police to limit their surveillance to instances when it is actually necessary. Drones permit the police to surveil people at all hours of the day and apparently at 1.30th the cost of other forms of aerial surveillance. The natural deterrent to abuse goes away and invites abuse. This makes strong safeguards absolutely essential. I think with, with every new technology that the, the government itself uh, acquires, abuse is rampant. When the NSA came over fierce attack in the 70s for wiretapping, and even with new Bush doctrine of, uh, you know, unwarranted um, American, you know, uh, citizen uh, surveillance, like to think that we'd have something in the sky that can penetrate walls that wouldn't get abused by governments. What's even more scary is that if private sector, private companies can own the same kind of technology and get the same license, what holds them accountable besides laws that aren't easily enforced? And like, how do you know when a violation has occurred? if they keep it within a certain system. You only find out much, after, much later after the fact.